Science is a word which describes how we attempt to explain nature and the world around us. For thousands of years, men and women have asked questions and attempted to provide explanations about how nature operates. Throughout history, they were called many names, such as sages or alchemists, but today we refer to them as scientists. Asking questions, collecting and analyzing data, seeking answers, and creating solutions is the method a scientist uses to provide explanations about the unknown. It is a process referred to as scientific inquiry. This artistic rendering of the great mathematician and scientist Sir Isaac Newton is an ideal representation of the scientific inquiry process. The artist has depicted Newton in a pose similar to that of Auguste Rodin's sculpture of the thinker, a classic symbol representing the analytical struggle of intellectual thought. Many people believe Newton discovered gravity by watching an apple fall from a tree. Sir Isaac Newton did not discover gravity. Gravity, as a force, had been a topic of discussion starting with Aristotle around 319 BC. Aristotle, while developing his hypothesis of locomotion, defined kinetic and potential energy with the help of falling objects. Aristotle believed heavier objects fell faster than lighter objects. This idea or hypothesis was challenged by Galileo Galilei with his experiments at the Tower of Pisa in the late 16th century, 100 years before Newton watched the apple fall. Each of these prominent scientists, Aristotle, Galileo, and Newton, contributed to Newton's formulation of the law of universal gravitation. Aristotle and his contemporaries believed that an external force caused objects to fall. In their time, this idea was simply a hypothesis, an explanation for an event, but one which could not be proven except by observation. By the time Galileo was experimenting with falling objects, the idea of an external force pulling objects to Earth was widely accepted by most scientists of the time and was on its way to becoming a theory. For a hypothesis to become a theory, it must undergo two tests. The experiment or event described by the hypothesis, the explanation of the event, must be reproducible. The result of the experiment must be the same, otherwise the hypothesis is invalid. This constant retesting of events referred to as experimentation, is how a scientist develops a hypothesis and proves a theory. How was Newton able to use Aristotle's and Galileo's hypotheses to develop his law of universal gravitation? A scientific law must pass two very simple tests. Number one, the results of any experiment based upon the law must reinforce the law. And number two, the law can be proven through direct and indirect observation. Direct observation, as in the case of Aristotle, Galileo, Newton, and yourself, is obvious. Objects fall. Galileo expanded on this idea by hypothesizing that some objects fall slower than others, not because of their mass, but because of air resistance. Two objects of equal mass, a pea and a feather, fall at different rates unless placed in a vacuum. When the air is removed from the experiment, the two objects fall at the same rate. This led Newton and other scientists to believe that the force acting on objects was constant. Newton realized that this could be proven through indirect observations. Let's examine the illustration of Newton again. There are elements in the image which are important to the process which Newton used to develop his law of universal gravitation. These key elements include the apple falling from the tree, the apples on the ground, the sundial, and of course, Newton himself. During the period around the year 1680, 
Newton and other scientists, such as Sir Robert Hooke and Sir Edmund Halley, were making major discoveries in mathematics, optics, astronomy, physics, and other sciences. They were all searching for a way to explain Johann Kepler's laws of planetary motion. If proven accurate and predictable, a law of universal gravitation would explain the motion of the planets around a sun-centered or heliocentric solar system. Such a law required both direct observation with telescopes and indirect observations using mathematics and a gravitational formula. In the illustration, Newton is comparing what he knows about gravity, based upon the works of Aristotle and Galileo, with his own laws of motion. He is observing the apple falling and the apples on the ground, and uses them to build a model of our solar system as described by Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The sundial represents both the period of the planets, which cannot be explained by simple observation, and the idea of a round or circular orbit, as well as a stationary sun illuminating the dial and keeping time, a notion which required mathematical explanation. These models provided Newton with a description of gravity, a force which could not only exist on Earth, but which was also exhibited by other planets. He was able to mathematically predict, with the aid of a gravitational constant, the orbits of the planets around the Sun, as well as the orbits of moons, comets, and other celestial bodies. Newton's law of universal gravitation was only possible through the process of scientific inquiry. Many scientists, such as Aristotle, Galileo, Kepler, Hooke, and Halley, all contributed their own hypotheses and theories to the effort. Their use of direct observations, models, and indirect observations of an external force acting on falling objects, and planetary motion, were the basis for the ongoing testing and revision of the ideas which eventually led to Sir Isaac Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. For over 300 years, Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation offered a constant explanation for gravitational attraction. Although still used today to explain gravitational forces, Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation was eventually replaced by Einstein's General Theory of Relativity. The search goes on. The search goes on. Goes on.